Preaching a sermon on unity because our children are studying unity and harmony. In the name of introduction, wow, this is a different sermon than what I wrote. <laughs> you might know who those guys are. The one on the left is a guy named Devil Ants Hatfield. The guy on the right is a guy named Old Randy McCoy. Those guys didn't want to be around each other, did they? But now they're forever remembered together, aren't they? <laughs> People who disagreed with each other. You know what the big disagreement was about? A hog. Yeah, one of them raised a hog and was kind of letting it graze in a feral sort of way. And lo and behold, it wandered into another's property. And he thought that he had feral rights to it too. And they had a court case over it. One, one family didn't like the decisions over the other. That's when violence started. That's when killing started. And, and then paybacks and retribution started. It went on for years, <laughs> on for decades. A lot of loss of life. And as much as I love bacon, <laughs> it's not worth it. It's not worth it. A disagreement that's become part of American history and folklore. I want to talk about disagreements today. That was uh, the church I served when I was in my first year of seminary. I was the youth director and the assistant pastor there. That was the, a, a church at the, at the Cobb County, Paulding County line out there between Kennesaw Mountain and Ackworth, Georgia. It was out in the middle of nowhere. There was nothing to name the church after. So they called it, except the county line, that was County Line Methodist Church. <laughs> There's a little country church that, uh, wow, still drew water from a well when I was there. And <clears throat> the old cemetery where the saints of the church had run on. And like the country churches, County Line had a tradition third Sunday of April to have what they called homecoming. And if you grew up in a small country church, you had homecoming too. That meant that everyone far away came back to be gathered for the service. It was dinner on the grounds. And in preparation for homecoming, you made sure the, the walls were, were painted white. You made sure the shrubbery was cut back. And you made sure the grass was mowed. And there was a man in the church by the name of Vance that really wanted the church to look especially nice for homecoming that year. So every day for a few days ahead of homecoming, Vance loaded up his riding mower, brought it out there and cut the grass. Even brought that weed whacker and cut it around the tombstones and things like that. Yeah, place looked really, really great. But Vance was out running errands Saturday after he had finished getting the, 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 uh, the grounds looking right on Friday. And as he drove by on Saturday, he saw a number, mem another member of the church by the name of Buddy riding on his lawnmower and waving at everybody who went by. And that just rode Vance the wrong way. Vance was stealing his credit. Vance was stealing his glory, or excuse me, Buddy was. And Buddy got, uh, Buddy got uh, his name on the grapevine, and Vance got terribly offended, and, and all these accusations went back and forth over who really got the glory for cutting the grass that day. Let me tell you, everybody in that church was related. There were four or five families that were all contributed to the, to, to the population of that church. And when... Vance and Buddy got upset with each other. Their wives got into the trenches too. And so did their kids and so did their grandkids and so did their cousins and aunts and uncles. Homecoming was not very wonderful that year. You could cut the tension with a knife. The way things even worse, Vance stayed so agitated. He, he was a cancer patient who was in remission. But with his tension and all his focus on that negativity, it came roaring out of remission and ate him alive. 
In the weeks and months that followed, Vance died very slowly. It was a tragic to see. And it was over cut grass. And if we could have raked all that grass together and put it in a big old giant bag and tried to sell it, we could have gotten a penny for it. But instead, love was lost. Time was lost. And life was lost. Disagreements. <coughs> Resulting in disunity and disharmony. You could probably come up with stories just like that yourself. Maybe your home life featured disharmony and disunity. Maybe it features that right now. Hey, could well be that your marriage has featured that too. And I probably don't need to, to articulate the heartache involved in something like that. Could be a place where you work. Could be a place that you go to relax. Could be your neighborhood. It could be any institution in which you're involved. You know those toxic effects of disunity and disharmony. It makes me want to go to the truth of God's Word find out why this is the way it is. But when you read of God's Word, you find out that it happened in that too. The story's told in the book of Acts about, oh gosh, it's white when I wrote this, I promise you. It's white at the 8 o'clock service too. Um, the story's told in the book of Acts about how, <clears throat> well, Paul, the Apostle Paul, and one of the other big champions of the faith, Barnabas, had themselves falling out. The scripture says sometimes later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Think about that. These guys have been on not one, but two missionary journeys. They weren't just gone for, for a week like, uh, like up to recreation. They were gone for years. I mean years. And they came back telling stories about how they started churches. And they did that not once but twice. And now they're about to go out a third time and it's, let's go back and see. Let's go back and see. Visit, maybe encourage the brothers of these churches that we've started. And they didn't want to travel just the two of them. They want to make good company. They want to have others to come along. So Barnabas wanted to take John, who was also called Mark. He wanted to take Mark with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Oh, we see what the problem is right away, don't we? Paul's a pragmatist. We can't blame, boy, I appreciate pragmatists. We want and need pragmatists. And back when they were on one of their former missionary journeys, Mark found the going too tough. He turned around and went home. He quit. So I know what, I know what exactly what Paul's thinking. He's thinking this guy, John Mark, is a quitter. If you quit once, there's a very high likelihood he'll quit again. Better that he just stay home and that way we won't be distracted by whether or not he's going to leave us. But wait, there's Barnabas too. Those of you long-time Bible st students, you know what the name Barnabas means, don't you? The son of encouragement. encouragement. Exactly. And man, we always need encouragers, don't we? I appreciate the encouragers in my life. I appreciate those Barnabas, but I appreciate those idealistic encouragers too. This is what I appreciate about Barnabas. He sees that John Mark grew up since that day he walked home in Pamphylia. Whatever it was that made him quit, he's going to encourage the quit out of him. He's going to encourage him for Christ and encourage him for kingdom purposes. So we had the idealist and we had the pragmatist. They probably started out just simply saying, this is a good idea, no, it's a bad idea. Well, John Mark has changed. Well, we can't take that risk. And back and forth it went, and back and forth it went, 
until they had sharp disagreements. As a matter of fact, the word reads all, they had such sharp disagreement that they parted company. The two heavyweights of the faith, Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left committed by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, God's grace is at work. Sad that, that the division happened the way that it happened. And this is not to, to try to put some stamp of approval on the vision, because obviously great things happen from this. Paul and Silas go all over Syria and Cilicia, and, and, and the church gets strengthened. And John, who was called Mark, he went on to do great things for the kingdom too. Thanks for the encouragement from Barnabas. Because the gospel according to Mark, he's the author. But still, people of faith, people of faith that experience sharp disagreement, may we please apply this to our everyday life? Because we're given a choice on so many different things to agree or to disagree. Let me tell you, that's become big business. It's become big entertainment. If you turn on the news, I can guarantee you what will happen. Doesn't matter what station you let, that you watch, the far left, the far right, even the middle. Let me tell you what you're going to see. You're going to see a news anchor person bring up a controversial subject. They'll have someone who's for it, they'll have someone who's against it, and they'll let them slug it out. And they'll verbally offend one another, and the ratings go whenever they do. It's entertainment. It's not news. It's not even debate. It's the sport of disagreement. And it becomes that it, our, our culture has become rife with it. And brothers and sisters, that should not be. That carries over into the church. We have disagreements over so many things. Some things that are non-negotiable. Some things that are comparatively petty. I've found that the people who are most agreeable have a short list of non-negotiable. I find that the people who, who, who disagree the most have a very, 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 very long list of non-negotiable. But is this God's plan for how the church should be? And I know it's in the context of, of of pointing out sin in a brother or sister's life, but Jesus gave us instructions to, to try to talk kindly to one another. And if we can't make a way to bring somebody else, eventually bring it before the entire church. And what a beautiful thing it is for something like that to happen. Again, I apologize for why this has been doing it. You think I've learned it by now. But Paul wrote to the, to, the, to the Corinthians, he wrote these words, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in the, in mind and thought. Isn't that a beautiful idea? Isn't it incredibly idealistic too? Look at that. All of you agree with one another. You hear that? Every one of you agree with me. <laughs> See the way I did. Okay? I wouldn't argue with you if I didn't know that I was right. <laughs> no divisions. You hear that? It means you can't be divided on whether or not music is too loud, too soft, too fast, too slow, too old, or too new. One, no divisions over that. One thought, one mind. Be perfectly united in mind and thought. That's kind of scary. They, they accuse us, even in the midst of our present diversity, they accuse us of groupthink. But a perfect unification in mind and thought is obviously something that's attainable. And get this, if we don't uh, grasp these things? Well, I, I put it to you this way. That unification of thought 
that unification of mind and heart around the person of Jesus Christ is obviously something that is incredibly attainable. This is what Paul wrote to the, to the Philippians. And I want you to read this with me. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, You see the word if in there at all? <clears> that kind of makes it all hypothetical, right? This will be our reality if. Depends on if we're unified on something. And if there's an if, then there's usually a then. And Paul's essentially saying if you stay unified, there are certain riches in Christ that will be yours. And thereby implication, if you decide not to stay unified, these riches will be forfeited. They will be given away. They will be lost. They will not be enjoyed because they will not be attained. What will be lost? Oh, things like encouragement. I love encouragement. Don't you love encouragement? When I'm down, I love it when a Barnabas kind of person comes along and picks me up and encourages me. As a matter of fact, when God uses me to encourage others, I have to admit, I get a great thrill out of that. I want encouragement. I want encouragement for everybody except for my enemies. I want my enemies to be discouraged. But wait, if I'm working toward unity, I shouldn't be thinking about my enemies. Now, should I? Okay, so encouragement becomes something that's celebrated. How about comfort? Does anyone prefer discomfort over comfort? I love comfort. I think you do too. I heard some people walking into the church today saying, man, let's get a seat with a, a cushion in it. I've never heard someone walk in and say, let's go find the most hard, lumpy, flat, shapeless, uncomfortable seat I can find. A hey, common sharing in the Spirit. Isn't that a great thing to have? I mean, the one that was there with God at the beginning. The Spirit, the Ruach Elohim, that just the Holy Spirit. If, if we insist on unity, it'll move. We can share it. If we insist on disunity, it will become grieved and it will lift. That tenderness, compassion. If we love these things, we ought to stay unified. If we're going to insist on disunity, expect all those things to go away. Our disunity would tell the Holy Spirit, you're not welcome here. It will leave. And just from the days of the priest Eli, Ichabod, the Spirit, the glory will depart. 